Welcome to this episode of On Finding Peace, brought to you by Life's Journey Life Coaching. Our host, Chris Shea, is a counselor, nationally recognized speaker, and author on topics of guiding us to finding peace in our daily lives. Learn more about Chris Shea by visiting his website, www.lifesjourneyblog.com. Another episode of On Finding Peace. I'm your host, Chris Shea, and this is the podcast where we talk about practical tips on how do we find our inner peace, how do we work on living daily uh, with an inner peace, and uh, I'm very pleased that in this episode, we are uh, joined with our guest, Darren Steves, and uh, we're going to be talking a bit about um, his book, and the title is, Are You Ready? Stop Wishing It Was Friday. Um, and it, it definitely has a, a great message and theme for finding peace, uh, especially about staying in the moment. Um, and uh, without further ado, uh, welcome, Darren. I'm glad to have you with us. Hey, thanks, Chris. I'm really glad to be here as well. Excellent. Well, really appreciate your time. And uh, if you can tell us a, a little bit about yourself and what you do. Sure. Uh, by trade, I'm an exercise physiologist, but I always joke with friends and colleagues and people I speak to that I'm a psychologist uh, part-time on TV. Um, <laughs> as, as all of us in these, these different health fields, you end up doing a lot of uh, um, informal psychological work. But again, my, my trade is uh, exercise physiology. So I've worked with high-performance athletes at Olympic Games down to um, – Canada games level here in Canada. So just 16 and 15 year olds. And then I also work in the, the wellness field. So I also work with our, our non-athletic crowd as well. So it's quite a, it's, it's quite a diverse background that I've had. <laughs> I've loved it the whole way. That, that's uh, that sounds awesome. And what, what uh, got you into the wellness field? Yeah, so I did an education degree first. So I was supposed to be um, a school teacher in physical education and math, but uh, realized quickly that that might not be my calling. And I had a, a job at a YMCA, really loved their slogan of spirit, mind and body and kind of started to encapsulate that, but realized I didn't quite have the the knowledge that I wanted. So I wanted to get a little bit more focused. So that's when I started searching and there was a job opening at Dalhousie University here in Nova Scotia, Canada. And hmm. I could also work full time as the fitness director there. So I started a master's in kinesiology with a, a mentor who I met who was just amazing, Dr. Phil Campagna. And I started that path in like uh, 1997. Um, and again, it just kind of bobbed and weaved from, from sport to wellness to, to fitness. And in the last five or six years, it's really started to focus on what we've been calling total health, um, as opposed to wellness. Um, and we wrote a paper on it and yeah, so it's, like I said, it's a long sorted path, like all of us, but in the last number of years, I've really started to make my one thing, um, total health for individuals and groups. Is there a difference in what total or whole health is versus wellness, or are we just changing the nomenclature? Yeah, it, it's interesting. And I don't know what your experiences have been, but being out in the community, wellness has a certain connotation, which I don't think is a negative thing. It's just, it, it seems to automatically conjure up certain thoughts when we talk about wellness. So for for some people, it's physical health. It's, uh, you know, physical activity and nutrition and so forth. For others, it's mental health. So it's, um, you know, mindfulness and so forth. We wrote a 150-page white paper called Behavioral Engineering. And within that, we wrote our own motivational model. And we, we suggested this concept of total health, which looks at life, uh, physical and mental health. So looking at nine core competencies, which lead a person to, to total health. Again, it's, it's just a different spin. We could use the term wellness. We've just started to use that term in, in placement to, to make it have that feeling of, uh, 
more than just one component. It's these, it's this multiple component. And we uh, suggest in the paper over a tedious 150 page <laughs> pages that that leads to total health and a higher productivity, you know, which are two important things in a lot of organizations. Right. Do you work uh, solely with organizations or also with individuals? I do both. Uh, you know, for the last 20 years, I, for lack of a better term, ran a personal training company, but you know, with two degrees and my experiences, it was a bit more than that, whether you wanted to call it a, a life coach or what have you. So I've worked with hundreds of people on that. I do a lot of talks. Um, I run resiliency programs, mindfulness programs, but yeah, in the last uh, three years, a, a colleague and I started uh, an organizational wellness program um, or wellness company. Um, so we do mm -hmm. more strategic planning for organizations and then uh, help with the delivery of the initiatives off of the strategic plan. Um, so we've right. kind of set up a, a high performance model of how do we do this right instead of just doing what we call random acts of wellness, which is what a lot of organizations do. They just kind of <laughs> throw something at the wall and does it stick great we'll do that and then kind of falls off so we've gone in and helped them create a strategy that uh you know drives things forward and try to try to make it more part of the culture right and you know i, I think in translating that into individuals i think there's a, a lot of similarity in in that i i find people tend to do the same thing in their own lives you know kind of take what sticks for a while and run with it. And then when it no longer works, uh, you know, grab something different or nothing at all. Uh, Chris, I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you. Um, I couldn't agree with you more. So when we wrote that paper and then my colleague and I, another colleague wrote the book, um, it was really based off this motivational model that we came up with. Um, a lot of people use the trans theoretical model, you know, that five stages of how people change. We, I like that, but we just put a different spin and looked at it. And so we came up with this concept called vibe and a lot of people, so that's an acronym. So we suggest that if people mm -hmm. get a vision for themselves, look at their internal values, the I, the barriers of why they weren't successful before, and then look at the E, the end result, which is your goal setting you're more likely to be successful if you go through that pathway. Uh, a lot of people, uh, I don't know if you would attest to, they just go to E. They'll set a goal. Um, I'm going to get 10,000 steps a day. I'm going to eat five to seven fruits and vegetables. I'm going to find a companion on uh, match.com or I'm going to get a new passion. And they just set a goal when it actually isn't in line with their vision or their values. Um, or they haven't looked at why wasn't I successful before. So our suggestion is if people do that, you're more likely to be successful. It's not a silver bullet. It's not perfect. But from our experiences, it's really helped uh, people perform or stick with their goal and make it more of a habit. Right. But what, what have you found that can work that keeps it as that habit? You know, because what I find working with the clients is they, they can understand that, of course, like, you know, with most of us, we get excited at the beginning, um, but as we get, you know, more into it, then we tend to just let it go. Mm -hmm. um, but what is it that occurred that can be to, to keep at it, um, you know, until it becomes that habit? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm sure, you know, a lot of the research around, you know, 66 days to build a habit. Um, and that's on a bell curve. So it could be 22, it could be 236, depending, <laughs> depending right. on the person. Um, I firmly believe in, in what I just said from my experiences. And I think this is why we're seeing multiple books and multiple people speak on value-based living um, that if you actually sit down and take time to write, who do I want to be? And what do I value? And if things drive towards that, then you're more likely to be successful and stick with it. So I'm physically active, not because I'm trying to get 60 kilometers this month. It's because I value my personal health and I write down the benefits to it. I read it. I keep a journal. 
those kind of things, as opposed to simply um, running to collect a certain amount of points on a challenge platform or those. So if it has deeper meaning, you're more likely to do it. It's kind of like, why do we brush our teeth? So how do we, how do we make brushing our teeth similar to the other things that we're trying to make happen? So people need to say, well, why do I brush my teeth? Where did that come from? Why is that a habit that, you know, most people in society just do, especially here in North America, they just do it. There's, you wouldn't think mm-hmm. of brushing your teeth, but some, many people would, you know, not think of going out and be physically active or eat fruits and vegetables or get eight hours of sleep a night. So I believe if, if it links to their value system and from my work over the last 20 some odd years, and even now in this resiliency field, um, I think the likelihood of success of building it as a habit, it grows. Right. So a lot of it dealing with that, not just the internal motivation, but also that it's something that has meaning for me. Absolutely. So it's intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. We know from the research that external, external, (laughs) excuse me, uh, (laughs) extrinsic motivation doesn't really have a, a does, isn't long lasting. So, but what, what our belief is and what we've written in our, our paper is you can use external motivation. That's no problem. Like uh, for our mindful hydration study, they got a water bottle at the end, but we really drove in internal motivation to get the external motivation. So a lot of people just do the external motivation as a programmer and they just hit that and then they're done. But we want to teach internal motivation. And I've just given you a bit of the secret sauce that we use is the vision and the values. Um, so that relates back to what you're talking about is that internal motivation. So right. do I want my personal health to be one of my top three values. Um, and I'm, right. I'm sure you and I are both a bit manipulative that we try to help people see the light of having their mm-hmm. own personal health, their own total health in their top three or four values is pretty important. And it actually, it, it, uh, it fertilizes usually the other values. So for example, my number one value is helping people. My number two value is my own personal health, but I know if my personal health helps drive me helping other people. So, you know, when we sit down and do that, counseling it's one of the first worksheets that we start to go through because like i said it does drive um it does drive you making it part of your life right and and you know in looking at you know what you're saying with that intrinsic you know uh, that's why i kind of went there because you know in looking at your work and and what you're doing that's one of the things that does impress me because if it isn't something that is meaningful to the self, it really is going to become a fad and it, it's not something that that's going to stick, mm-hmm. you know? So, you know, in working with my clients, you know, we, we really need, need it to be, it's not what I'm saying or what I'm believing, but ultimately what are you believing? Okay. Um, you know, and, and that's going to make the, the change for the person. Yeah, I, no, I couldn't agree more. I will say that the number two thing, which shocks a lot of people, but I don't think it'll shock you, Chris, which is the, one of the theses of our paper, paper is normalization of failure. Ah, um, uh, yes. Yeah, we believe to, let's start normalizing it. You're going to fail, and that's fine, uh, because we know through the resiliency research, uh, resilient people are problem solvers. So one of the people in my class today, in my resiliency class, brought up but what about a divorce like going through a divorce and those kind of things and I said grief is normal so you'll go Mm -hmm. through grief but what resilient people do is they start to realize after say five or six months hey this this was a good experience that gift out out of a out of a bad case I realized that this person's values didn't match my values now I'm now I know what I'm I'm going to bounce forward which instead of the word bounce back We're going to bounce forward and say, now I know what I'm looking for in a partner, for example. So normalization of failure rather than I've had a friend sit and you've probably got a thousand of these cases. They sit there for 20 years in grief. Um, Normalize it. Failure is normal. Um, 
and I work with a, a VP of, of human resource at a university. She was so excited to tell me she was doing this mindfulness app and she had 20 of 20 days. And I said, that is horrific. What happened mm -hmm. this day 23 and 24? My experiences have been people go, look, there I go, I fail again. And they get into that helplessness and, and learned hopelessness, uh, learned helplessness and hopelessness state rather than going, well, I got 19 more days than I did last year. So out of failure, we need to learn. And I've been parts of, of big failures, you know, uh, out of Rio, we, one of the ones we were supposed to hit a medal in at the Olympics and we didn't hit it, but then it ended up being one of the best experiences of my life. Cause we did a full two day debrief with the whole team and the athlete. And you want to talk about uncomfortable, but the next four years are going to be awesome because of what we learned out of that failure. And this was a person who was like a two time world champion previous to that. And I would say we learned more out of the failure. Are we happy that we didn't hit it? Absolutely. Or no, we're not, but um, yeah, that's, so that's a big thesis. And, and I think if people in our society can understand that it's normal to fail, my brother writes uh, tobacco, he does tobacco research and tobacco policy. And we talk about it all the time. You, you know, the classic stuff around, you know, it takes seven times before you might, you know, quit using tobacco. Um, right. It's just normalizing it and saying, well, that was normal rather than, you know, getting down on yourself and getting, like we said, into that learned helplessness state, which is I'm a failure. See, I couldn't do it. Right. And, and I'm so glad that, you know, you've talked about that because I agree with you that I, I wish society would look at failure for what it is, mm -hmm. you know, that it is a learning experience. And if we do take that out of it, you know, what did I learn about myself in the process and all of those pieces, I can then grow from that experience, become a better person and hopefully not repeat that. But then if I do, well, again, now what do I learn from that? You know, so um, I think in, in a lot of ways with society's views on failure, it stopped people from taking a chance or, you know, taking a, a risk about themselves. You know, so maybe I want to help myself become more in touch with wellness and I want to exercise, but I know I'm going to fail at it. So why even start? Exactly. Like, yes, hopelessness. One of the first clients I had at the university is now the chair of Alzheimer's research. One of the smartest individuals I know, he got offered uh, the head of uh, Alzheimer's at Oxford university and he turned it down because he wanted to stay in this neck of the woods. And we were at a social function and he came up to my wife and said, I just wanted to shake your hand and say, your husband changed my life. And I'm sure you've had these experiences, Chris, and I'm standing there going, all I did was help him get active and live a little healthier. Right. But he said, which was one of the more profound experiences. And this was uh, about 15 years ago. He said, you know, I teach some of the stuff to my residents that Darren and I did in our initial interview. And these are the things that I go when I initially meet with someone, what I just told you as I get them to write the vision letter. But as we're talking about, everyone's tried this before. So why did you stop running? Why did you stop playing hockey? Why did you stop swimming? Why aren't you sleeping eight hours a night? Did you do it before? Yes. And then we actually start to create strategies of like you just said, if it creeps back in or to hopefully not have it happen again, but if it does happen, that's okay. Let's just get back on track and hear the strategies we're going to use to get over those barriers to being successful in whatever aspect of wellness or total health you're, you're striving for. Right. Yeah. And we, we just need to shift that perspective so that people can look at their lives, you know, from this new shift that take a chance, you know, risk, possible failure so that maybe I can learn more about who I am and therefore understand more about what I need out of life. And, uh, you know, this way I can move forward. Um, I, I really like how you said that, that bouncing forward instead of that bouncing back. Uh, that, you know, comes out of that, that comes out of the family research and resiliency because mm -hmm. 
with, with family, uh, which I'm sure, again, you can attest to, I've said it a few times, is we don't bounce back with family because family is so fluid and it's constantly changing. Um, so that's where that term came from, is they use the term bouncing forward. So again, I have, Excellent. A, yeah, I have a friend who's going, do I divorce my husband or don't I? And it's whether he wants to bounce forward with her and she's getting into the problem solving where it's, yep, I know that's who I was. I agree. Cause I said, be prepared. The daggers are going to start flying and you can say, yep, that was me. I agree. I was part of the problem, but now I want to be part of the solution. Let's bounce forward. We're not going to be like we were when we were 22. We're both 45 now. So what, how are we going to progress forward? So again, you start to become that problem solving. And again, as I told you, I'm not a psychologist, but I play one on TV because you, you end up with all your little life lessons helping. But again, my, my expertise is in how many minutes should I run and how often, but what I came to realize early in my career is that didn't really matter. It was more, how am I going to get this person out to run after that? It's, it's an easy solution. You know, you can figure out heart rates and this and that, but, for most people, it's how do we get them to a point of, like we've talked about, making it a habit. Right. Well, you, you definitely play one well, uh, you know, when it comes to being a, a psychiatrist. But, um, you know, when, you know, we look at things like that, you know, I mean, it's all about motivation. Uh, you know, I, I teach a, a university class and I have many different majors uh, within that class. And, um, you know, a lot of times they'll mention, you know, we, we don't need all this psych stuff. You know, why are you giving us all the psych stuff? But I, I think a lot of it comes down to what you were just saying. You know, it, if you are into fitness and you need to get somebody to work their fitness program, you need to motivate, but you're only going to motivate if you can understand what their mental blocks are, what their emotional blocks are, what their fears are. You, you need to have that understanding so that you can work through those to get them to do what they need to do. Mm -hmm. Totally. I, I think the coolest uh, research I've read recently, it's, it's the, the business world is mirroring this. So in North America, the way to the C-suite, which is the, be the CEO or what have you, is still through finance. In Asia, a majority of people who make it to the C-suite go through HR, human resource. Because they know how to motivate people, they know how to motivate people, and it's slowly coming to North America where it's, oh, we actually need to motivate these people to, you know, work at the level we need them to and keep them engaged in discretionary effort and so forth. And like I said, it's the same thing that I saw in my field is I can write the perfect program that's going to help you lose 25 pounds and put a smile on your face and all that. But I realized quickly it was more about changing a behavior and how do I motivate this person to want to do this? Um, so that's where you start getting into all the tricks and tips and strategies of how do we keep this piece, person striving towards this vision of themselves, not just their goals. The goals are just kind of the steps towards this overall vision they have for themselves. Right. And that's the other thing that I like about, you know, this whole total health issue, because it is about the totality of the person. It's not mm -hmm. just focused on what's good for you physically, but also the physical, the emotional, you know, the, the uh, psychological, spiritual, I mean, you know, nutrition, throw it all together. We, we are, you know, the, the totality of things, not just a, a particular piece of a person. Right. All right. Yeah, absolutely. Finances, uh, relationships, it all starts to fit into one big ball because um, we know people um, are, like, so for example, um, one of the new things in tobacco is to start a fitness program. So instead of a patch or so forth, because if you can start the ball rolling of this is who I want to be and I want to be a healthy person, you start to go, okay, well, why am I using tobacco if I'm doing all of this? Um, we know people who are more financially secure are more likely to, you know, sustain a health behavior. So you might need to bring in the financial mm -hmm. counselor. We could do all the things right, but if they're swimming in debt, they, there's no way they can start a physical activity program or get to bed at night or eat better. So it's, first of all, getting a good snapshot of the person and what are they dealing with. 
and then start to what we call create a team around the person. And a psychologist and I do that for some senior execs is uh, we take the athletic model because when I said I did that debrief with that uh, athlete from Rio, there was six staff around the table. There was a psychologist, sports psychologist. There was a physiotherapist. There was a sports med doc. There was a head coach, an assistant coach, a physiologist. Um, so these athletes have IST teams around them, and there's nothing wrong with people to create their own IST team. And I became a bit of a case manager for people, which I think is how I sustain my clients long term is because we would constantly look at how are we going to sustain this behavior? And for some, it was the financial thing. For other people, it was having a meaningful relationship, which can help sustain it. So yeah, it's really doing that almost your own 360 review about yourself. Right. Which I, I wish, you know, more people and myself included, you know, would spend, you know, time every day doing that, you know, so that we can really see what's working in my life and what are those areas of my life that I need some improvement and how am I going to do that? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Because so, there's, there's two philosophies, right? Is some people are motivated by, tackling it all at once. There's a few people that can handle that because they see so much change, it motivates them to keep going. But for a lot of people, it's more building blocks where it's, okay, I'm going to, what's the most important thing for me right now? First, like I said, for some people I work with, it's financial security. So I'm like, well, let's start the, um, the physical activity program in a month. I'd love you to go see this person, get your finances in order. Cause once that angst comes down, then we're more likely to go, okay, now I have time to do this. Or, I mean, I'm just using that as an example, but mm -hmm. um, that would be a, a prime example of let's do an analysis as, as a life coach and say, where do we need to, to work on? Maybe it is mindfulness because the anxiety, you know, having heart flutters four times a day. Um, then let's, let's address that first. Maybe physical activity is part of that plan, but that's the thing we got to try to, to crack right now and it kind of opens up the box of, all right, and then let's build on that and have a, a quadrennial plan like we do with athletes. Let's have a four year plan of getting to the end, not the next two months, which every, right. infomercial, every infomercial says they can do in two months and just make you this perfect person. Yeah. I, I love watching those uh, infomercials and commercials that, you know, do do nothing but take this pill and you will be fine and, you know, whatever. It's like, yeah, really. But, uh, yeah, do absolutely nothing and your life will change. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like logic says that this makes no sense, but okay, whatever. Yeah, let's throw logic. Um, yeah. <laughs> So where, where did you, uh, you know, looking at, at all of this, where, where did you come up with, uh, you know, your book and, and especially the title? And I, I love the title, um, but where, where did you come up with the book? Yeah, it's, uh, it's been in my own life. I've been on a self journey as we all are for 20 years. I had chronic pain and then met, uh, a psychologist in California, Dr. Wise, and he was one of the most influential persons that I've met. Um, so again, I've had anxiety in my life. It's uh, inherent with my family. So I've had to self-discover how do I do that for myself? And then again, the 20 years of working with hundreds and hundreds of individuals and it just, the same, it, it was like when my brother worked in uh, mental health for youth, the, the stories just keep the same story keeps coming up and up and up and up. And I was like, holy, this story is a, is a common tale. So I talked to my friend who's a very good writer and I said, would you, and she's a exercise physiologist as well. I said, I got this idea. I'd love to write a, a narrative book. Um, I don't know if you know the book, the wealthy barber, but I had was one of the first books I read, which was a narrative tale of how to save money. Uh, and David Chip, Canadian here wrote it. And it was like, I was 21 and my sister bought it for me. And it's, you know, the 10% rule and RSPs, which is similar to your 401k plan down there. But it was a narrative tale about this couple that's referred to this barber and they go every three weeks for a haircut and learn about finances. Um, so I love the way that he had done it. So I said, this is the idea that I have is let's write it this way rather than just writing a, a how-to book uh, with tips and so forth. So that's where we started. She liked it. 
and we just started going back and forth and back and forth and, and maneuvering it or massaging it, sorry. And when we got closer to the final product, I put it out, you know, as we all do with the sweat on our brow, I put it out to six friends and colleagues. And said, <laughs> what, what do you think of this? And within a week, I got six messages back saying, why did you write a book about me? And I called Sue and mm-hmm. it's perfect. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. So everyone was taking a little bit and some people, literally two people thought, you know, you literally wrote this book about me. And I said, well, thanks a lot. And one person in particular, Amir Naveau, who I thanked in the, in the forward, I mean, he really helped out. He gave us lots of excellent, good ideas after the fact. And um, he loved the book. So that's kind of where it came from. And of course, from what we've talked about already, I think the words, are you ready, stood for me for sure, mm-hmm. as you do need to be ready. It's not about want. My brother and I talk, everyone wants to be fit. Everyone wants to stop using tobacco. Everyone wants to stop drinking alcohol. Everyone wants to be in a meaningful relationship. It's more, are you ready for it? Um, and I love that. We were just going to go with that. But then, you know, this TGIF, <laughs> I can hardly wait till it's Friday. And I just kept saying to myself in my head, really? That's what it's all about is you're waiting for two days on the weekend and that's your life. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I wanted to smash those two together and make sure that's at least it resonated with me. You got to be ready and let's start living life. Let's stop wishing it was Friday and let's glad it's Monday, glad it's Tuesday glad it's Wednesday. I'm not saying we have to walk around like a, an, a um, you know, internal optimist and that forth. There's nothing wrong with feeling, having the feelings of depression and anxiety and feeling down at times. But, you know, if the majority of time we're kind of being present in the moment, living life, you know, I think that's more what it's about rather than waiting for yep. Friday at five o'clock. So that's kind of where the book came from. And then uh, about halfway through, I said, you know, just in case people don't catch parts of it, we wrote uh, each chapter has a did you notice and a starting point and a tip. Mm. So we kind of put both together. Um, you know, one chapter is did you notice Alex was using alcohol as a negative coping skill and then kind of a bit of a tip of how to do it. Did you notice Alex went to the gym and didn't really enjoy it? And then a starting point and a tip, you know, you need to evaluate before you go, is the gym really for you? It only fits about 15% of the population and maybe do an activity inventory. What have you done before that you like? Because there's a linear relationship between fun and physical activity. If you don't enjoy it, you're not going to stay with it. Right. How many people have I had come in when I worked at a gym and start the Stairmaster and go, this sucks. I went, okay, there's no sense trying to come in and use the Stairmaster because within 30 days you're going to quit because you don't like it. So let's do an activity inventory and see what at least you can tolerate, but you have fun. So we, we wrote the narrative all about that as Alex meets Jim from across the street and helps him and becomes this mentor, which is also a big term in today's society. Uh, But we wanted to make sure that people caught all the points. So at the end we wrote the 46, did you notice tips and starting points? Right. And, and I, I love, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the, the title, because it is all about that mindfulness. You know, and it, as you say, it's, it's not the, I'm going to spend my life looking forward to something in the future. Right. But do I appreciate what's happening with me at this present moment? You know, and whether I like it or don't like it, but can I at least appreciate that it's happening mm-hmm. without being focused on something, you know, back, you know, going to happen? Um, but really stick with what is happening. Totally. The best way I've heard it defined is if you're thinking about the past, you're probably having depression. If you're thinking about the future, it's probably anxiety. So the more time we can Mm -hmm. spend being present, um, the less likelihood you'll have those feelings, but it's okay to, to go back as you know, into your past and you just kind of go, Oh, there it is. I'm coming back to the present. Or if you start thinking about the future and what could happen, just coming back and and living presently uh, is part of that strategy to create that um, behavior as well and create that habit. Right. Exactly. And, you know, like what we were talking about earlier, you know, for me, what's important about the past 
is not to dwell there, but what do I learn from it? Mm-hmm. You know, so that it can prepare me for this present moment. Right. You know, and and so I, I agree with you. I mean, for me, a lot of it deals with living in in this moment and the whole mindfulness concept. Yeah, and again, the the research is quite profound over decreasing all those mental health uh, can, uh, problems is by living in the moment. And I know you were interested in hearing about the mindful hydration. Uh, project that we did but that's exactly Mm -hmm. that's exactly what we did so to combine this mindfulness and how to build a habit we know that people um have the habit of drinking water which we jokingly Mm -hmm. say you've got to drink water ain't a habit you got to do it um and i had read gretchen rubin's book um better next year or a better life sorry i I should know the title but I, i had conversed with her and I, I thought of the concept, but if you take a new behavior and tie it to a habit, you're more likely to do it. So the classic would be, okay, every time you brush your teeth, do five push-ups. So if, if you're going to, if you have the habit of brushing your teeth, tie something new to it. So when I walked, mm-hmm. when I worked with Dr. Bill Howitt, who's the psychologist who do a lot of work with, we said, well, what if we tie this mindfulness to drinking water? Um, we might get this double bang effect, people being more hydrated and then also getting some mindfulness because um, we know that if you can get eight to 10 minutes a day of mindfulness, we might actually start to see this neuroplasticity. Um, We might actually start to see the brain change and have this positive effect. But um, as I knew, if I asked people, we'll just do 10 minutes a day of mindfulness, they would Ah, I can't believe I got to do another. How am I going to fit this in? So we knew that was what would come at us. So we decided, what if we just get, you know, 10 events throughout the day or 15 events while you drink your water is to stop and take the time to be mindful. Mm -hmm. This little protocol, you know, um, become present, be present, and then receive your gift, which is drinking the water. Um, Came up with the protocol. I taught it over six webinars and it was one of the most profound experiences in the last 23, four years that I've been working because we had the, the participants journaling as well after each webinar. And it was more the qualitative responses we were getting. The quantitative was going up, of course, that, um, you know, strongly agree my mental health's improving the quantity of water. But we would ask them if they had any comments. And it was, uh, it was crazy, Chris. It was... Um, <laughs> I've had dry mouth from a medication for the last five years. It's 80% gone. My concentration levels have higher. I've had stomach problems for the last year. It's dissipated. Um, I wasn't going to take the manager job at the hospital because of my anxiety. And I've decided in the last two days, I'm going to take it because of the way I'm feeling. And we had hundreds of these because we had 400 Mm. people in the project. And it was just week after week, it was these constant, constant comments, which kind of solidified for me that mindfulness needs to be um, in this foundation of resiliency program or foundation of changing a behavior or just general health, total health. It just needs to be part of it. It just confirmed it for me. And I have a biased opinion towards physical activity and, uh, (laughs) I think that's been, you know, because people always ask you what, what's the one thing you need to do? And, uh, you know, there's no easy answer, but I'm a pretty big advocate now of make sure you're doing your mindfulness. I mean, I've, I've personally meditated for the last, since 2006, I do it twice a day, um, called paradoxal relaxation, but, um, yeah, it's, it's been awesome. It was a, a great experience. That's so great because it's not just you, you know, getting out there talking about it, but you know what the experience is and and you know what the outcome, uh, you know, can be. So that really makes the big difference as you're trying to encourage others to do the same. Yeah, no, I had, uh, you know, I don't don't bash Eastern medicine or sorry, Western medicine. I think it's great and does lots of good things. But uh, I will say that when I went to that clinic in California and it was really more of an Eastern medicine philosophy of this paradox or relaxation. 
And of all the things I did, it was the one that fixed my chronic pain. And I remember the day I was doing, again, it's a form of meditation called paradox or relaxation. So until you accept the pain, it won't dissipate and make it become, make it become your friend. Anyways, on day four of the clinic, I was doing the relaxation and all of a sudden I just felt this like emotional thing happening and I went, okay, I'm not supposed to be thinking, get back into it. And uh, all of a sudden I took a, a deep breath and it felt like someone put a, a key into my um, L5 S1 for all those people who know the human body. That's your low back, <laughs> which is a very common spot for pain. Uh, it's your mm-hmm. SI. And it just felt like someone turned a key. Uh, the tears were flowing down my face. I felt like getting up and running around the room. I was laughing. And um, so I had some sort of like muscular release and emotional release. And well, let's just say I was sold after that. So awesome. Yeah, it was an awesome experience. I mean, I still go to a doctor. I still take medications from time to time. But uh, I think if we can marry this Eastern and Western medicine together, people would be so much more successful. Um, uh, I totally another, agree. Another funny story from that is, of course, when we went to the clinic, it was all type A's. It was the surgeon. From, <laughs> it was uh, it was the stockbroker from New York. It was the CEO from Australia. So we'd all gone through it and people had different experiences and we're sitting around the fireplace because he had a cabin out in Sebastopol, California. Uh, the physiotherapist would work upstairs. We would do it in the sunroom and we're sitting around the fireplace and I don't think the guy from New York really got it even after the seven days. Mm. Dr. Wise asked, is there any questions? And he put his hand up and he's still tapping his toe and he said, uh, yeah, how long do I got to do this for? <laughs> <laughs> So Dr. Wise, yeah. Dr. Wise put his fingers together because he had the same condition and he figured it out himself. He put his fingers together, leaned back in the chair and said, I have a piece of chocolate cake twice a day. And that's all he said. And I certainly understood what he meant, but I still don't think my friend from New York understood what he said. No, just on the basis of the question alone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but no, I, I, I'm a fan I think there's all kinds of different methods and you're right. It did help me have an appreciation when we decided to do that mindful hydration project. It was like, okay, I'm bought in. I get it. Let's do it. Let's create it. And um, yeah, big fan of it. Excellent. Where can the people find your book? It's on uh, pretty much everywhere. It was my first experience. I think you've written a couple of books, haven't you? Or uh, Articles I, I publish. Okay. Yeah. So no book yet. Uh, my, my business partner, sorry, my colleague who I wrote it with was the expert. So yeah, it's on the amazon.com. It's on iBooks. It's on Kindle. So you can get an actual hard copy through Amazon or you can mm-hmm. um, get the ebook on any of the different spots that, uh, that are available. I think we've, we've hit them all. So it's pretty much on any of those. Excellent. And if people want to learn more about you and what you do, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Yeah. uh, The name of our company is Vendura Wellness. It's V-E-N-D-U-R-A Wellness. Um, So we have a website, VendoraWellness.com. And our Twitter handle is the same, at Vendura Wellness. So if people want to fire a question at me, feel free. I'm usually pretty good at uh, getting back ASAP. And as uh, we both love talking about, I love talking about it. Um, I love the behavioral change stuff, but again, I, I didn't get too much into it, but I am a physical health guy. I mean, we could have said that, you know, if you get less than seven hours of sleep, you've increased your risk of depression and anxiety substantially. So that's important. There's a real sleep movement at Harvard. Um, we just talked about water two to two to four liters a day, um, can have a massive increase as we said on anxiety and depression, Um, 150 minutes a week is all we're asking for, for physical activity and can Hmm. massive effect on triglycerides and cholesterol and blood pressure. So um, I, I, these days I seem to getting away from talking about physical health, but I'm still (laughs) super passionate about that. So, and I, you know, I know lots of little tips on that stuff and they're, they're in the book. um, Cause like I said, uh, they're, 
they're all super important. I mentioned earlier about having, having fun. There's also an indirect relationship with intensity and adherence. What that means is for a majority of the people, as they increase their intensity, they're more likely not to do it. So be okay with hmm. low level physical activity. You don't have to do, and, and I, I might not, I probably shouldn't say that you don't have to do CrossFits. You don't have to do P90X. You know what? 150 minutes of moderate physical activity going for a walk, gardening has just as much benefit to it. So, you know, just, Excellent. Uh, just do what you like and do it at a level that you like and don't believe the hype that you have to do it at this level and you have to do it six hours a day. <laughs> Excellent. Well, and, and that's good advice because uh, I think that's what people go by. And I, I know that's one of the things I go by. So, um, you know, maybe that's something I could start changing my perspective on. Um, but I, I really appreciate your time and, and your insights and, you know, the fact that there wasn't a lot on the fitness might just mean we need another podcast at some yeah, point maybe. to talk more on the fitness. Sure. So, you yeah, know, so. It, it's, it's a, a, you know, large uh, topic and, uh, you know, we can definitely do another part that focuses more on, uh, you know, that fitness end to give everybody the well-rounded, you know, aspect of, of finding that peace within themselves. Yeah. My favorite question that I always get is how much physical activity is enough? And when I do a lot of talks, I always give the same answer. If it was the 1300s, you wouldn't be asking me that because it'd be 10 hours a day. <laughs> you dead. You could have to fix your roof. You'd have to grow your vegetables and so forth. So let's see if we can just squeak out 150 minutes first. Uh, exactly. And then go from there. <laughs> yeah, go from there. Yeah. I, I like it. Well, again, you know, thank you for your time. Thank you for, you know, the, what you were sharing with us and, and your insights. And, uh, you know, I really appreciate it. So thank you very much. Thanks, Chris. Keep up the good work. Thank you for listening to this episode with Chris Shea. Learn more about Chris Shea by visiting his website, www.lifesjourneyblog.com.